Welcome back, everybody, to our our first hybrid Dharma Doors. Yay! As usual, I'm MC Owens. We are continuing our study of the uh, Manjushri Bodhisattva Pure Land Sutra. We've been working on this sutra for a while, but you know, I recently changed the uh, kind of the format of the Dharma Doors here with the idea that we would give each night a theme. And so the theme for tonight, the kind of the, the idea that I wanna kind of be focused on is the idea of Buddhahood, uh, the nature of Buddhahood. We sort of know about this idea if you're in the world of Buddhism or Dharma studies, the idea of Buddhahood is pretty common but what exactly is that or or you know what is that so we're going to focus on that to, tonight um this is going to be part of a ongoing conversation um that we've been having about different buddhist paths so tonight we're going to dive really deep into this idea of what is called the Shravakayana, the way of the Shravaka, the Pratyakya Buddha Yana, the way of the solitary enlightened being, and then the Buddha Yana, the Buddha vehicle. So as I mentioned, we've kind of slowly been going through this particular Buddhist sutra that is about, well, it could actually fall into a few different categories, but we're mainly looking at it as what is called a, a Pure Land Sutra. And I've already done a, a few talks at the beginning of this sort of sutra. This was a number of weeks ago now, but I did a, a few talks about, oh, this idea of a Buddha land. So this idea of a Buddha field and also then the, the related idea of purifying a Buddha land. And, you know, I don't want to rehash all of those talks. So, you know, this is a very sort of special kind of Buddhism, this pure land business. And I'm hoping that you were either there for those talks or you've heard me mention pure land stuff before because it can sound a little out there right or maybe a little theistic it's like sounds like heaven and things like that but as i tried to explain this pure land and the idea of purifying one's buddha land it's really kind of basic in a way it's really about changing one's relationship to one's environment changing one's disposition to one's environment, changing one's relationship to one's environment. And, you know, I mean, honestly, just to put it simply, I heard somebody say this recently. It was about how their whole world changed. This is actually how they put it. And I thought that this was so interesting. They said their whole world changed by doing one thing. <laughs> with their face. They said they had noticed that for is, is a, a kind of a default mode facial expression, their eyebrows were like this. Hey, hi. Hmm. And they realized when they started greeting people <laughs> with their eyebrows up, it started changing their entire world. <laughs> People were nicer to them. And all of a sudden, everything started changing just from raising their eyebrows to a friendly, joyful look of versus <laughs> amazing, right? How, how much more, how much more is there that we could do to change our worlds? <laughs> Not just raising our eyebrows a centimeter, right? So at the basic simple level, this purifying one's Buddha land 
is that idea of changing the mind, the disposition, and that changing one's actual reality, like actually changing the way everything happens in that sense. So that's, again, that's kind of pure land Buddhism, simply put, but there's a lot more to this. And this sutra, I want to go back to the official formal title of this sutra. The official formal title of this sutra is about the, the arrays of virtues, the guna vyuha, the arrays of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha Kshetra. So Manjushri Bodhisattva, when Manjushri becomes a Buddha, and has a Buddha Kshetra, a Buddha field. This sutra is about the arrays of virtues. Interesting idea. Tonight, we're going to get a little bit more clarity about what exactly that means to sort of decorate or adorn one's world with virtues. So we're going to go deeper into that tonight. But what I want you to know is, is that the sutra, as it's been going along, these various people, first it was a bodhisattva who was a householder uh, bodhisattva, then it was a monk named Shariputra, but everybody keeps asking the Buddha questions about purifying Buddha lands, and in particular about these arrays of virtues of Buddha lands. So where we're at in the sutra, just to kind of bring us quickly up to speed, that monk named Shariputra had asked the Buddha about purifying a Buddha land. And just to repeat really quickly, because I'm, I'm going to kind of review a little bit of that, the Buddha said, well, it's really basically just these four qualities that make one's will kind of lead to one's Buddha land being pure. And those four qualities were about not forgetting one's vow or staying um, determined of fulfilling a vow of the vow of the Bodhisattva. I'll talk about that again in a second. The second was about having great compassion, maha karunya for all sentient beings. The third was to have great determination, great virya, great drive. And then the fourth was to, um, well, it could kind of go a few different ways, but it was about Kalyana Mitra, spiritual friends, and having spiritual friends, kind of uh, associating with Kalyana Mitra, teachers and spiritual friends. <laughs> Those were the four things that a bodhisattva could do to make sure that their pure land gets purified. And then, in addition to those four, the Buddha then starts to say, oh, and by the way, Shariputra, if you want to make sure that those qualities the, of your purified Buddha land, if you want to make sure they don't degenerate, kind of degrade in that sense, and kind of uh, your, your pure land slipped back into not being such a pure land. If you want to do that, he says there's one quality, one quality you should have. You should be like Akshobhya Buddha, imperturbable. <laughs> and there are a few other qualities to Akshobhya Buddha, but imperturbability was sort of the theme of that night. Then what happens is, is the Buddha says, oh, and by the way, there's two qualities that a bodhisattva, if they have them, their pure land will not degenerate. <laughs> and those two are not to pursue or encourage others to pursue the way of a shravaka, the way of a voice hearer. And number two, not to pursue or encourage others to pursue the way of a solitary enlightened one, a pratekya buddha. Those two things, right? And I actually, that was where we were sort of kind of at last week. 
And I didn't fully finish the section on the two qualities that will keep us from uh, having a degenerate pure land in that sense. Um, so we're going to pick back up there and we're going to go deeper and I'm going to finish this section. I actually think this is really interesting. It's going to take us a few steps to get there, but the really interesting thing that the sutra has to tell us, it's about why, why you wouldn't really want to pursue the way of the Shravaka, the Shravaka Yana, and why you wouldn't really want to pursue the way of the Pratekya Buddha. So before we find out about exactly why you wouldn't want to do that and why you might not want to pursue or encourage others to pursue those two paths, let's get clear again about what, what are those two paths? Like what's going on with that? So I've spoken about this a lot, I know. And so I've definitely tried to choose a few things new tonight in case you've heard all of this before and you're like, oh, here he goes again on the Shravakayana protect your Buddha thing. But I, th I actually really am interested in this and I'll tell you why. So really quickly, in case you really don't know what these words are, <laughs> I, I would like you to stay, you know, stay with us. So a Shravaka or a voice hearer it's a Buddhist term for, well, it depends on who you talk to, but it's basically a term for that early form of Buddhism that was around and is still around, by the way, but was very popular at the time of the Buddha. And for a few hundred years after the life of the Buddha, there was this kind of rather austere kind of ascetic tradition of renunciation, shaving your head, wearing robes, begging for food, being celibate, being homeless, you know, being a monk or a nun. It's one of the things about Buddhism, of course, is an equal opportunity religion in that sense. But that path, the path of the renunciant, that becomes known as the Hinayana, the little vehicle. And the idea of it being a little vehicle is the idea that it's, it's kind of, it's asking a lot <laughs> in terms of the renunciation, this grand renunciation, particularly the celibacy thing, maybe the homelessness thing. But the idea is, is that that path is rather, you know, it's for a, a, an elite few. That's that. And again, what I want to kind of remind you is that that style of being Buddhist is still in the world today. And of course, if you're familiar with the Theravada tradition of Southeast Asia, the forest, uh, Thai forest tradition in Thailand, those are representative of this earlier form of monastic Buddhism. Again, it is still alive and well in the world. Thankfully so. Number two is this solitary enlightened being. It's called a Pratekya Buddha. The word Pratekya Buddha literally means solitary Buddha. We know Buddha means awakened one. I did a whole night on the idea of enlightenment, the idea of awakening. So I've talked about Buddha as awakening and someone who is awake. Again, that was a whole night that we spent on that. And there's this idea that there's a Buddha, but it's a Pratekya Buddha. And there's a couple of different ways that I, in dictionaries, in sutras, there's a few different ways that I've seen that term, solitary Buddha, I've seen it defined. Why solitary? It's sort of actually kind of, I can think of right now maybe three different examples of why they're called that. The first one that comes to mind is it's the idea that a Pratekya Buddha becomes awakened, a Buddha, all on their own. They've never read a sutra, they've never heard a Dharma talk, they've never sat at the feet of an enlightened teacher. They literally just figure 
it out. What is it? I will tell you in a second. But the idea is, is that a solitary enlightened Buddha is somebody who figures it out all on their own. So that's a solitary Buddha. There's another related definition of solitary enlightened one. And it's the idea that this enlightened person doesn't, it, it's hard to explain, but they basically, they don't have a teaching. They have awakened, but they couldn't explain it to anybody. So they don't have a dharma in that sense. They don't have a teaching. And so they remain alone. And that's sort of related to the first one, by the way, too. Not having received it from a teacher, the Pratekya Buddha didn't awaken from a system. And so they can't take that system and then tell it to somebody else. They didn't know about that system. So again, that's sort of another thing about them being a solitary enlightened one. And then the third one is more about sort of the lifestyle of this Pratekya Buddha. They're, they're described uh, as being like a lone rhinoceros horn. <laughs> and the idea is, is that a Pratekya Buddha is, is in certain traditions, if you're trying to find a definition for these Pratekya Buddhas, you're going to find a few different ones. And then one of them talks about them as these forest dwelling enlightened people. Once again, the solitary idea is that they're all off there on their own. They don't have a community. They don't have a sangha. So that's kind of related to them not having a teaching, which is, again, kind of related to them figuring this out all on their own. But the idea is, is that they're a Buddha, but they're all on their own. Now, what is a Buddha? Well, it's really helpful to know a define, what is the defining characteristic of a Buddha? <laughs> Most of the time, and as usual, everything I'm saying should come with tons of asterisks and warnings and caveats about how much I'm overgeneralizing. But the idea here is, is that there's one, actually it's a book, it's a text, but there's one idea that really encapsulates the Shravaka Yana, the way of the Hinayana, the way of the monastic. And that one book, which is also an idea, is the Visuddhi Maga, the path of purification. So the Visuddhi Maga is a pretty famous Sri Lankan Buddhist manual. It's a, it's a celebrated Buddhist manual of how, how to achieve nirvana, I would say. But the idea is, is that while all of the teachings and all of the Dharma can be found throughout all of the sutras, this one Sri Lankan monk in the 5th, 5th 6th century AD systematized the Dharma. He was a Theravadan or what would a what would equate to a Theravadan Buddhist, and he systematized the whole path, the path of purification. And a lot of people refer to that because it's a systematic presentation of, of the practice. Now, again, that's the book, but what it's about is this idea of visuddhi, purification. And there's a lot to that idea. And again, depends on who you talk to. But the basic idea from a very general point of view, Buddhism, early Buddhism particularly, talks about this idea that we are infected, afflicted, you know, infected with these poisons, afflicted by these mental poisons, these defilements they're called. These are these kleshas. Greed, anger, and delusion. So really quickly too, just to kind of put, our, put us in the right frame of mind, greed, the first of the three, right? 
let's be really clear about what we mean by greed. It's sort of not, and again, again, overgeneralizing, whatever, but yes, being greedy, like, but you already have three, but I want four, <laughs> right? That's like classic ideas of greed, right? Wanting more or something like that. The idea is sure, yeah, that's an aspect of this affliction, this klesha, right? This, this uh, raga, <laughs> but that idea of greed, it's more about, or at least I, th I wanna say that, I don't wanna say it's more about this, but I think it's really helpful to be thinking about it this way. It's this klesha, this affliction, it's very related to, if not identical with addiction. Need, needing stuff, needing it. Now, from a Buddhist point of view, we are all addicted to sensual stimulation. We get bored without it. And therefore, and actually, we often get irritable when we don't have it, right? Like if the, I don't know, the internet goes out or something, right? And we can't access our stimuli, we could get irritable. And from a Buddhist point of view, that is like addictive behavior when you can't get your stuff. And so you start to get irritable as a result. The, as far as I can tell, Buddha Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, see addiction as a spectrum. And yes, there's all kinds of substance addictions and chemical addictions, but the whole human experience is one of this out of control needing and wanting. And in particular, I wanna emphasize this idea that what, what's really going on is about when we can't get what we want. It's how the Buddha defines dukkha, not getting what one wants. It's what he says in the very first sutra. So I wanna make it clear that that first affliction is this about this like needy, wanty, cravy, addictive kind of disposition towards things. It's not about enjoying things. It's not about living, not at all. It's about what, how do you feel when you can't have it? That's the test of one's greed in that sense. And of course, from a subtle Buddhist perspective, we can want or crave or desire this, this attraction, this raga. It can be to, to, you know, towards anything. It's actually what, in a way, makes us each unique. You don't probably crave and desire the things I crave and desire. <laughs> in fact, the things I crave and desire might actually put you off in that way, right? So the idea is, is that we all do it a little differently, but in fact, if you've got sensory organs, this is why Buddhism is always talking about all sentient beings, because the idea is, is this, if you have sentient or, uh, organs, you will fall victim to this. Animals are like this. Try taking the food away from the animal. They get angry, they want it back. They suffer from it too, the gods suffer from it. In fact, again, all sentient beings suffer from it. So that's the first affliction, this quality of craving in that sense, of the wanting. The second one, anger, yes, it's about anger. And you, know, you could just pretty much stay right there. <laughs> Because if you could work and control your anger in that sense, <laughs> all the other aspects of this, right, of Dvesha, of the third, of the second Klesha, bitterness, resentment, jealousy, all of those, they're forms of anger, perhaps in that way. But that's what that second one is about. It's about this sort of getting angry. And it has a lot to do with not getting what we want <laughs> in that way. So there's a really re a, a intimate relationship between greed and anger in that sense. So then there's greed, then there's anger. And then the third klesha, the third affliction 
is moha, is confusion, sometimes also translated as delusion. But in Buddhism, it's really important to know that confusion or delusion, the third klesha, it's specifically being deluded about the nature of the self. And last week, I did a whole night on this idea of anatta, of no self, because it's so important. So those are the three afflictions. A confused, deluded sense of self, anger, and this greedy wantiness. The early Buddhist path of purification, the Visuddhi Magga, is about purifying oneself of those three afflictions. That is the early Buddhist path. And I mean, and that's very helpful information, how to do that, how to put those three things in check. And, and by the way, if you're not like the no self thing is either still eludes you or you're it's yeah i don't know about that no self idea then just substitute you know con being conceited and narcissistic and all that you know the worst parts of ego that's aspects of the third right the third affliction but it just goes all the way to the root which is this idea of no self but again i digress the idea of that being a Buddhist monk in the early days of Buddhism, or being a monastic, or even a way of practitioner within that Theravada tradition, one is going for purification of the mind, of citta, purifying it of the three poisons, and that basically the whole path of the shravaka, of that Hinayana, its stages, four stages in particular, of course, stream entry, once returner, non-returner, arhat. And the arhat has been fully purified of the conceit of self, no more anger, and no more craving, wanting, desiring. <laughs> purified. Now, what I emphasized a few nights ago, and when I first sort of introduced this idea of the, the bodhisattva path versus the shravaka path, I made it very, very clear. The idea is, is that the shravaka, the, the early Buddhist path, and that monastic path, it is focused on the individual. The individual and the individual's emotional state mental state, and then about coming to stability in that, emotional stability, mental clarity, and all of that, but it, just me. Now, to put it simply, I said that the bodhisattva path of the Mahayana tradition, not the Hinayana, but the Mahayana, the bodhisattva path is defined by not just pursuing awakening or purification for oneself, the bodhisattva is on this path to see that all sentient beings are awakened. It's at first blush, a exceedingly altruistic tradition. Altruism being this idea of having all sentient beings in mind in this pursuit of enlightenment. So that's, again, just putting it simply. A simple division between the bodhisattva path and the arhat path is this idea that the arhat is just in it for themselves. But I don't want to make that sound bad <laughs> necessarily. What I mean by that is, is that the world would be a much better place if everybody checked their greed, anger, and confusion. Yes, that would, that would work. And I think that that was the idea of early Buddhism, which is, but if everybody just does this, the, you know, it'll be a different world. 
I think that that is true. It might be a tall order to try to get everybody to renounce in that way, but I guess it would work. The Bodhisattva though has a very different starting point. And what I mean is, is that it, well, I want to start introducing, let's see, where are we at? Oh, we got lots of time. So I want to start introducing this threefold division. So I had been operating within the Hinayana Mahayana, Arhat Bodhisattva. Tonight it gets more complicated because I'm introducing the Pratekya Buddha for the, because the sutra does. And so now we have these three categories. We got the Shravaka, we got the Pratekya Buddha, and we've got the Bodhisattva who's on their way to Buddhahood. So that's the Buddha Yana, the Buddha path. Let me give you, and I did this a night uh, earlier, but I want to do it again. I think it's going to be a helpful analogy to work with for the rest of the evening. So again, I've done this one before, but just bear with me. So I'm going to use what I always like to use, which is the, uh, the dream analogy. So using the dream state that many of us visit every night, right? I want to use a, having a dream as an example of walking you through these various paths of Buddhism. And the idea is, is that let's start with just a regular old dream. Now, when I say just a regular old dream, what I mean by that is a dream, but I think it's really happening. That's what I mean by a regular old dream. So, and in particular, what I want to talk about is a nightmarish dream in which one is seeing terrible things. Now, again, what's terrible to me might not be terrible to you. So I'm going to leave it very vague and just the idea of imagine you're having a dream in which you are witnessing terrible, terrible things. The idea is, is that if you are having one of those regular old dreams, you're going to think that you, what you're seeing is really happening, that what is around you is reality, and then you would respond accordingly. And what I mean by that is, is that if it wasn't a nightmare, but it was some sort of delightful dream in which, I don't know, again, your delight might not be my delight, but let's say that you, you know, the, a vision of delight for you, whether it's a, well, any of the sensual pleasures, but you see it there and you get excited by it and you indulge in it in some way. That would be greed manifesting in that dream world. And again, you think it's really happening. So you are indulging your senses and in, in that. Now, I mentioned that I want to kind of paint this as a nightmare. So this is going to be about fear and things scaring you. And so you're seeing these things and maybe it's making you angry or fearful or what have you. But, but again, you think it's really, really happening. So you were emotionally disturbed by it all. And then, of course, what I mean by this regular old dream, in a regular old dream, you think you're a regular old you, meaning you think you're a, a, like, in, like a person in your dream. That's similar to that delusion of self. It's similar to it. Remember, this is an analogy that I'm going to make use of later. So we're just talking about a state in which one is seeing things and thinking they're real, like in a dream, and then responding. And you think you're a person in that dream. And uh, by the way, what I mean by that is, is let's say that that terrible thing that you're witnessing in this nightmare, what if it started to get closer to you in in the dream 
that's the delusion of self because you're you're asleep in bed right and you're having a dream but you think you're a character in the dream and and you think maybe your body's in danger or something right so that's a delusion of self and again fear and anger and maybe also desire and greed in that way okay so that's a regular old dream i'm hoping as i always do that you have had a lucid dream experience in your life so that this can make sense so of course a lucid dream is one of those odd experiences that some people have some people have them often but it's where you're dreaming but then something happens and you become aware that you're in a dream you don't wake up but something shifts and you're aware that this isn't real you remember oh i'm asleep in my bed whoa okay so now let's use that lucid dream to talk about a, a state of being now there's two ways to work with that dream scenario the arhat and and again this is an analogy so just bear with me what it means to be an arhat is and and again this is really technical but the basic idea is an arhat doesn't need to be lucid doesn't need to know they're in a dream or not the most important part about an arhat is that they are not getting greedy not getting angry and not confused about the nature of the self what i mean by that is just to and i'm painting a very artificial scenario just to make a point this is nothing about practice or anything in real life this is just to make a kind of a comparison and a point but what you can imagine is is that when let's say a stream enterer so you're not an arhat yet as a stream enter, you keep having these nightmares of this terrible thing that causes all kinds of emotions in you, right? But as you become an, a once returner, a non returner, there's a way in which you can encounter that nightmare and be emotionally calm about it. And then by the time you're an arhat, you could then fall asleep wake up in that nightmare but not be afraid of it and if it were about attraction you've controlled yourself and so even though there's this tempting sensual thing here you are self-controlled the greed or the this desire isn't arising the anger and fear isn't arising and the delusion of self isn't arising that again is about the path of purification where it's about the three kleshas and eradicating those and again about emotional stability a buddha is the one who is lucid a buddha and this is the reason why i use this dream analogy so much and in particularly the lucid dream a buddha the word buddha means awakened one and the idea is is that the buddha is awakened and in my dream analogy it's like that being who becomes aware that they're in a dream and what i'm getting at is is that that being that knows oh this is a dream this stuff isn't real and therefore i don't have to be afraid of it and there's no point in desiring it it's not real so the pursuit the striving the wanting the craving is futile because these things aren't real and the fear of them is futile because it's not real so a buddha in that sense is is awakened 
the idea is, is that a Pratekya Buddha awakened, lucid, knowing it's a dream, yet the terror and nightmare are still right in front of them. But they are like an arhat in that they are emotionally stable and balanced and they are not greedy, angry, or deluded about self. So they're like an arhat, but they are awakened to, well, basically emptiness, which is equivalent to that idea of that, that the, what they're seeing in the dream isn't real. They understand that it is provisional, temporary, all of these ideas. Yet, they are still seeing and, and in a way encountering all of this terror. But again, they're cool with it and they know it's not real. <laughs> Where we're going to go in the re for the rest of tonight is towards Buddhahood, not Pratekya Buddhahood, but like the Buddhahood that a Bodhisattva is going for. And that's because the Bodhisattva recognizes that the entire dream is their mind. Not just the little speck, the little aspect that is reacting to the dream, but they understand that they are the entirety of the dream. And so if there's a bunch of terror going on over there, something's wrong here is the idea. Now, remember, I'm in still using my dream analogy. And I think that you can, like, just from like a very contemporary psychological point of view, I'm thinking Freud, I'm thinking Jung. The idea is, is that from that just simple point of view, I think you can understand what I'm getting at when I say that if you're having a nightmare where there, there's all of this terror going on, but you think you're okay because you're not afraid of it and you know it's not real, you're not going far enough of asking that deeper question of why am I manifesting all of this? Why am I thinking all of these terrible things all the time? Even though, again, <laughs> I'm not disturbed by them and I know that their ideas or thoughts and therefore not real. So the purification of a Buddha land just to kind of bring this full circle, would be when the dream is no longer a nightmare. When the dream is, is again, pure in that sense. So that's that analogy of the dream. Of course, how this plays out in this dimension, in this reality that we find ourselves in, is very similar. The arhat becomes a worthy one. They become this very emotionally stable, very balanced person. They do not get angry. They do not crave and desire and get, you know, worked up uh, in that way. And they are not confused about that delusion of self I talked about last week. As for the rest of you, good luck. I've, pure, you know, I'm speaking from the point of view of an arhat. I've purified my mind. How is it going for you? Is the basic idea. Because from that early Buddhist point of view, your karma is your karma, and you have to work it out. And my karma is my karma, and I'm working it out. That's the perspective of early Buddhism. The Mahayana tradition comes along and has done some deeper investigation and realizes something, or I would actually, as I always say, the Mahayana remembers something. <laughs> the Mahayana tradition seems to have said at some point, wait a minute, didn't he say there was no self? <laughs> Meaning this idea of my karma, <laughs> that's part of the delusion of self. This idea that this as a karmic axis is a delusion. It's a delusion on so many levels, actually. 
just to think about the air, right? That you breathe out and breathe in, right? It, it's a vastly complicated interconnected web, this life thing. And so the idea that my little karma is just circulating within a little uh, microcosm of itself isn't, it's not intellectually honest <laughs> to the way that this is functioning at all. And then if we take into consideration the Buddha's original teaching of no self, the Mahayana says, hey, why don't we start there <laughs> with that idea of no self? and proceed rather than the arhat way, which seems to hold on to that idea of self for a very long time, and maybe even never lets it go. So, so hopefully I've kind of clarified the three vehicles, the Shravaka yana, the Pratekya Buddha yana, and the Buddha yana. Everybody doing okay with those three vehicles? And basically, cool. So now we can talk a little sutra. So let me, yeah, I'll do this for, I have one important thing I want to get to, but let me deal with this a little bit. So let me reread this a little bit. So he says, the Buddha says to Shariputra, Shariputra, if bodhisattvas have these two qualities, their aspirations will not degenerate, and they will acquire an array of virtues in their Buddha realm. What are those two? Shariputra, the first is that the Bodhisattva should not yearn for the Shravaka Yana, should not enjoy teachings of the Shravaka Yana, and should not consort with practitioners of the Shravaka Yana, nor encourage others to pursue the Shravaka Yana. Second is that they should avoid the Pratekya Buddha Yana and not encourage others to uphold the Pratekya Buddha Yana. Shariputra, bodhisattvas who encourage others to take up the Buddha vehicle, the Buddha Yana, they will, now it says they will master 10 subjects. What are those 10? I'm going to tell you what those 10 are in a second. So this is a bodhisattva who's interested in not getting people to be arhats or solitary Buddhas, but to go for full Buddhahood. And if a bodhisattva is encouraging others to do the Buddha path, they translated this. And remember, this one that I'm reading is from the Tibetan. It's an English translation from the Tibetan. And they translate it as that the Bodhisattva will master 10 subjects. Now, as many of you know, I also have the A, original Chinese version of the same sutra. It hasn't been translated in its entirety into English. And so I'm referring to the original Chinese. And the thing about it is, is that I really like the Chinese version of this because it was translated from Sanskrit into Chinese in around the year 700 AD by a Buddhist monk named Shikshananda. And if you are, fam if you are familiar with the famous, I'm always holding it up, the famous Avatamsaka Sutra, right? The giant mother of all sutras. This English version by Thomas Cleary was translated from the version of Shikshananda. My, po my point is Shikshananda is a very famous translator, but he's somebody who I personally am very familiar with his Chinese, like his way of translating. So I'm excited that Shikshananda is the one that translated our Manjushri Sutra here. So I went back and referred to the original Chinese, and I got to tell you, it's very illuminating. It's a little unfortunate that the Tibetan translators don't refer to the Chinese version. They really should. I don't know Tibetan all so well. I can like 
kind of muddle my way through it a little bit, but what they translate as the bodhisattva here should master 10 subjects. In the Chinese, it's not about mastering. It's this word that it's a, a particular word that I really have grown really fond of. In Sanskrit, the word is samgraha. Um, to harmonize, to integrate, to bring together. It's a really interesting word. And my guess is, is that it says samgraha or something to that effect, parisamgraha or something to that effect in the Tibetan. And there's a way that if you, you know, of all the dictionary definitions, like if you get down to number four, entry number four or five, it can be master. But number one and two are about this idea of bringing together, harmonizing. So according to Shikshananda, the Bodhisattva, trying to get those to yearn for the Buddha vehicle, they harmonize, bring together 10 virtues. Now that's really significant considering the whole point of these sutra is about the array of virtues of a Buddha land. So I, as soon as I read Shikshanandas, I was like, oh, that's how this relates to the whole theme of, of this array of virtues. So very different, those two translations, the Tibetan version, which is about mastering subjects, and then the Chinese, which I'm translating, and it's more about harmonizing virtues. So keep that in mind when I read these 10 things. And again, I'm just going to refer to the Tibetan, but when necessary, I'll tell you what the Chinese says. So these are the 10. These are the 10. They will uphold or preserve a Buddha realm without any shravakas or pratekya buddhas. All right, so there you go again with that. So that would be a virtue of their Buddha land, that there's no shravakas or pratekya buddhas. They will obtain a sangha in their, in their pure land, entirely made up of bodhisattvas. They will, they will be considered by the blessed buddhas is what they say in this in the chinese it's actually a little bit re the reverse which is that they will the bodhisattva will keep in mind the blessed buddhas as a kind of remembrance of all the buddhas so that's actually kind of a little significant twist number four uh they will pr proclaim the way of the buddhas and teach their dharma. Number five, they will engender or bring about or manifest a vast mind with vast mental states. Number six, if they're born as gods, they will be born as chakra or brahma. If they're born as a human, this is number seven, they will be a chakra vartan a wheel turning sage king number 8 they will constantly see buddhas number 9 they will be pleasing to gods and humans and number 10 they will acquire an immeasurable uncountable mass of virtues so those are the 10. Um, because I want to get to the other, the really kind of more significant part, I'm only going to kind of mention a few of these or kind of chat about them. I already actually changed the Tibetan to match the Chinese. So this is where, again, refer, being able to refer to multiple languages is really helpful. The Chinese is really nice because these 10 are literally numbered. They, it's literally number one, this, number two. And that list is very helpful for making sense of 
what was clearly some confusing Tibetan because they translated one sentence as, well, they combine, they, they put together a few of them so that it reads that this bodhisattva will engender a vast mind and vast mental states for the sake of chakra and Brahma. Even when I first read that from the Tibetan, I was like, why is a bodhisattva going to make a, produce a vast mental state for chakra and Brahma? Like it didn't even make sense to me at the time that I read it. And then I went back and read the Chinese and it's like, oh, no, no, no. It's this two, these two things that the bodhisattva idea is that if they happen to be born as a god, they will be the highest of gods. And if they get reborn as a human, they will be the highest of humans, a chakra vartan. So those are these 10 virtues or subjects that this bodhisattva masters or harmonizes. And, you know, some of that's a little odd, or it might sound a little odd. I would kind of want to just stay focused on the main part of it though um and what i mean by that is what's up with this section like what what's the grudge that the buddha has against the shravakas and the protect buddhas like why are they always not satisfying in that sense right so and in particular with the bodhisattva here why is it that they're going to be so you know, dead set on there not being any Shravakas or Protekya Buddhas in their Buddha land. Well, Shariputra. What's up with all of this? <laughs> he literally says, why, why all of this? He says, compared to establishing beings, in the universe, the language here is so weird, but compared to establishing all beings of the great trichiliocosm in the fruition of an arhat or establishing them in the fruition of a Pratekya Buddha, the merit of causing a single noble son or noble daughter to arouse the mind set on complete awakening is far greater. So if I try to encourage you all to become monks or nuns or become shravakas, or if I encourage you all to become awakened beings, but all alone, the merit would be much greater in that sense, right? To encourage you to be Buddhas, to arouse the mind for awakening. Why? When a Shravaka, a voice hearer, or a Pratekya Buddha arises, that doesn't prevent the lineage of the Buddhas from being broken. Without the appearance of a Buddha, there are no voice hearers and Pratekya Buddhas. However, Shariputra, when a Buddha appears, the lineage of the Buddhas remains unbroken, and one can also find voice hearers and protect your Buddhas. Shariputra, bodhisattvas who establish others in the mind set on awakening will master the above mentioned 10 subjects. Shariputra, if bodhisattva mahasattvas have those two qualities, their aspirations will not degenerate and they will acquire a array of virtues of a Buddha realm just as they wish. Okay, so we got through the section. Questions, comments, answers, ideas from all of that. I'd love to hear from you. Anybody? All crystal clear? Yeah, Tony. 
maybe I missed something. I'm a little confused. So, um, so you're only going to have Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas if there's a Buddha around, right? And at the same time, one shouldn't pursue the Pratekya Buddha or the Shravaka path. Huh? according to this to this sutra uh-huh. so what does that mean that you don't have <laughs> shravakas and protect buddhas around if there's a buddha does that maybe doesn't mean it i don't know okay yeah so the the basic kind of gist of what they just said was that if the bodhisattva does it this way they're going to keep the lineages of the Buddhas going. And the idea is, is that when Buddhas appear in the world, that's when you get Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. But the idea is if no Buddha appears in the world, you don't get Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. So the idea here is, is that it's, it's kind of like actually quite logical in a kind of um, like if you've ever studied any moral moral philosophy and the idea of like, okay, so if everybody went for the solitary or sorry, the, the Arhat path, and let's say I encouraged everybody to do that, how would that play out in the long run? And what they're saying is, is that if we kept doing that, it would break the lineage of the Buddhas and Sure, you could have Shravakas, but you wouldn't have any Buddhas. Same thing with the Pratekya Buddha path. However, if the Bodhisattva encourages other beings to pursue Buddhahood, and they themselves are headed towards Buddhahood, that'll bring about Buddhas in the world, and then there'll be Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. So this is, it's kind of this um, misunderstanding about Mahayana Buddhism. We read a sutra a number of months ago called the Sri Maladevi Sutra. And in the Sri Maladevi Sutra, this was one of her main points. It was about Hinayana and Mahayana. From the perspective of the Hinayana, there's two different traditions. There's the hardcore real Buddhism that the Buddha taught, and there's all of this bodhisattva nonsense, all of this mumbo jumbo about pure lands and all of that. There's the real Buddhism and there's all of that. (laughs) But from the Mahayana point of view, it's all Buddhism, that path and this path. It's all Buddhism because the Buddha uses upaya. So sometimes it needs, for some people, it's about renunciation. For other people, it's about this. And the idea is, is that all of that is the Mahayana. So that's why we, meaning I, am interested in promoting Mahayana Buddhism, because it includes the earlier path. The earlier path, though, excludes anything that comes after it in that sense. So, so there's, that, uh, there's that, just clarifying that that was why the emphasis on not having, or not, it's, it's about inc- not desiring a pure land where there are Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, really wanting a pure land just full of bodhisattvas, right? make a little sense i do want to talk about what this sort of means in like more practical terms i basically i kind of want to take my dream analogy and bring that down back down to earth in that way so one of the things one of the things that i want to mention let's see do yeah i got time i'll mention this so I'm, I, I brought it up the other night, and it's a very subtle yet huge difference between 
the Arhat and the Bodhisattva. The Arhat path, as I already mentioned, and it actually, the, it even mentions the language of the, um, sorry about that, but about attaining the fruition of the Arhat or the fruition of the Pratekya Buddha. So early Buddhism, that Shravakayana path that I've been talking about all night, I mentioned that it has these four stages. Stream entry, being a Shrotopana, being an Anagam, or sorry, a Shrotogaman, a Chakra Dagaman, apologies, a once returner, Anagaman, non-returner, and Arhat. Those four stages, they're called fruits, like um, fruitions, coming to fruition. And when one gets there, it's called an attainment. You have attained the state of an arhat or attained the state of a once returner. So the arhat path, the, the early path is demarcated in attainments. And this language, and not just this language, but this actual form of practice is still very, very, very much alive and well in the practicing world of Buddhism, meaning that people who practice the Theravada style of Buddhism talk about attainments. And make claims of attaining things. If, again, I've mentioned this uh, the other night, but if you've read the Heart Sutra, the Pranya Paramita Heart Sutra, the kind of a foundational sutra for Mahayana Buddhism and the Bodhisattva path, if you've read the Heart Sutra, you know that the Bodhisattva makes no attainments. And that's what makes them a bodhisattva in that way. I say this, and even though, again, it's a very slight, subtle point, it's actually very, very huge and significant. And what I mean is, is that if you've heard those people talk about attainments, it starts to sound rather strange. <laughs> again, coming from a tradition that's about the teaching of no self. So to hear claims of attaining things, it begs that question I raised last week. Who is attaining these things? <laughs> and the idea is, is this, and I've used this, I use this, this analogy a lot to describe this idea of attainments and the bodhisattva who makes no attainment. So the analogy that I use comes from a pretty famous Buddhist text. It's not a sutra, although it's often called a sutra, but it's technically not because it's not words of the Buddha. It's a commentary. But the commentary is called the awakening of faith, the technically the awakening of faith in the Mahayana. And it uses quotes from the Buddha, which is why it's sometimes called a sutra. And in there, it uses a story that the Buddha told. And the story is about a person who's lost in the woods. And it's a new moon night, so it's completely dark, cloudy. They cannot tell north, south, east, or west. They are completely lost. What the awakening of faith says is that the moment the person doesn't care where they're going, they're no longer lost. Just like that. What's interesting about that is in the beginning when we're lost and we don't know which way is north, which way is south, the idea is, is that I'm lost. And somebody could come along 
and say, oh, north is that way. And I would say, awesome, thank you. And now I would be able to find my way home and get unlost. The way that you could put that is that I got unlost by attaining knowledge of which way was north, south, east, and west. So I got unlost by attaining something. But that other way, the way that the Buddha mentioned, where as soon as I don't care where I'm going, I'm no longer lost. That's like getting unlost without any attainment. Because you didn't acquire a little bit of knowledge you didn't have before. Remember, before I didn't know which way was north, south, east, or west. Then somebody came along and gave me a piece of knowledge, and I got the knowledge, and I was like, ah. But the other way, when I got unlost, but by just no longer needing to get somewhere, I didn't need to rely on someone else, nor did I need to acquire something. Actually, quite the opposite. I needed to let go of something, which was the desire to not be where I was. That is, for me, a very subtle way of actually talking about it. I kind of realized it while I was telling that story. It's a really interesting way of describing the, the three paths, even that Pratekya Buddha. So that Pratekya Buddha would, in a way, be like a Buddha, which is that they would no longer desire to get anywhere and therefore no longer be lost. But again, from a traditional point of view, they wouldn't know how to convey that information to others. They themselves would just not be lost. And it is great to not be lost. And that's why, again, we want Pratekya Buddhas, we want Shravakas in that sense, because we want people to be purified of greed, anger, and delusion. We want people to be awake. We want all those things. And so it's not about those two paths being bad. It's just there's this way that they're not quite as excellent, I would say, as this Buddha path. Yeah, Tanya. So one thing that I was just struck by is that with the... Um you know, the analogy of being in the woods and once you don't care where you're going, you're not lost anymore, is that you can achieve nirvana, Buddhahood or whatever, wherever you happen to be, so to speak in life, right? You don't, you know, it's more of a matter of perspective, I guess. Excellent, perfect, exactly. Uh, Excellent, I would, I'll add to that. Let me clarify, or, you know, just, again, just add to what you just said, Tanya. So tonight's theme was about Buddhahood, right? And it's an interesting idea, Buddhahood. It's, let me try to make that being lost in the woods analogy fit in here. So, there's a number of ways I can think of, and I, I, it's my thing now to really only try to speak from my experience, because I really don't know other, other people's experience in that way. And so looking at my own experience, I would put it to you this way. What it means to be lost in the woods and what it means for me to be wondering which way is north, south, east, or west, It's about this idea of, well, a number of things. But it's kind of, and again, it's unique for all of us. So just kind of plug in your own life experience in this sense. But it's any sense I have. And again, these are so subtle and deep. But the idea that I rent, I rent where I live. 
but it would be so nice to own my own home. That now is a goal in that sense. And the idea is, is that, and, and again, I'm, I'm trying to be delicate about this, but the idea is, is I'm not happy now, but I could be. That's the idea of where's that bigger house? Is it north? Is it south? Is it east? Is it west? How about more money? Which way is more money? How about people liking me more? Is it that way or that way? How about how? And the idea is, is that all of the infinite ways in which I feel my life lacks or shortcoming or that I could be so much happier or this or all kinds of things, even if it's health, for example. Even if it's like, um, whatever, my lower back's been hurting. Where, where, where's my, where is, does my lower back not hurt? Is it north? Is it south? Is it east or is it west? Because then I'll be happy. I'll be happy as soon as that's resolved, as soon as I own my own home, as soon, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. The idea is, is that at a certain point, somebody could come along and say, hey, you know, here's a bunch of money. You could buy a home. That would be attaining something. Or I could be good here now entirely, 100,000%. And the idea of the Dharma, by the way, the, the, the beauty of this teaching is that it is in all of our power absolutely to do that. Because again, it's not about getting a bigger house or getting more money or this and that. It's actually about a mind that doesn't compare in that way and say, oh, real happiness is over there. Ooh, they look happy. They, that must be real happiness. So as soon as I am like them, I'll be happy. So anytime it's being <clears throat> postponed, anytime your joy or your you know, peace in that sense, is being postponed because you're waiting for whatever it is. The idea is, is there's that non-attainment way. And that's again, more of the Bodhisattva path where it's a path of wisdom rather than, as I say, a path of self-control in that sense. Because the early Shravaka path, that monastic path is rather repressive in that sense of that it's about self-control. The Bodhisattva path, as I've mentioned, begins with wisdom and then kind of works backwards from that in that sense. So, so on that note, Buddhahood. So yes, Buddhahood, a state of being, a fully awakened being, would, of course, be one of <laughs> being good where <laughs> they are. Uh, obviously, that's part of the idea. And on that note, I'll mention this. One sec. <clears throat> I've mentioned this a uh, few few times, probably in Dharma doors long ago. And it, it was a funny realization I had about Buddhas and meditation. Like many people, I was under the impression that one meditated, you know, sat cross-legged, meditated in order to get enlightened that you meditated in order to become a Buddha or become awakened and that to get enlightened. There was a certain point in my practice, in my practice where I realized, oh, you don't meditate to get enlightened. You meditate because you are enlightened. And what I mean by that is the image that it was like, it was rather cartoonish, but it's how it occurred to me. M many things occurred to me in kind of cartoons in that way. 
But the cartoon was one of <clears throat> the process of awakening, the process of enlightenment. And the unenlightened being rushing here and rushing there, trying to get this and trying to get that. And then maybe rather than giving, I mean, sorry, rather than acquiring, becomes very generous. Oh, you are giving it away. So the idea is, is that as the practitioner moves along and they're kind of acquiesced in that sense, relinquished attachment to things, not pursuing, it starts to kind of get like, well, I'm not really pursuing a lot of stuff anymore. And, you know, I got really, you know, it's, it's kind of nice right here. I don't really need to be over there or need to be over there. But I guess I'll just cross my legs and, and be here then. And you find yourself meditating, but again, not to get enlightened. You're meditating because you are enlightened, because you don't need anything anymore in that sense, right? You're not pursuing that sweet spot anymore. That's the idea. So just a subtle kind of idea about meditation. How are we doing? Questions, comments, answers, ideas? I really like what you just said about the, yeah, you just end up meditating because <laughs> you're just being. It makes sense, right? Like when mm -hmm. you really think about, oh, that's why I'm not meditating because <laughs> right? I want to watch that show or I want to do that or I want to do that. That's why you're not meditating because you want to go do those things instead. And then the idea is, is when your joy and delight in this world is not dependent and you can produce it and manifest it <laughs> all you want in that way, that's the idea of Buddhahood. Let me say one last thing too, just to um, end a thought about my dream analogy. So I mentioned this idea of being in a nightmare, being an arhat who could be in a nightmare, but be totally calm and cool about it. <laughs> then I talked about a pratekya bhutta, a kind of awakened being who understands the nightmare is empty, is not emotionally disturbed by the nightmare, but is in a way still witnessing the nightmare. And then the idea of a Buddha who has kind of been able to change what they're actually experiencing, not just be cool with what they're experiencing and, and understanding that it's empty, but then actually being able to not change it like a magic show, not like that, but it's about understanding that it's all reflective of mind. And so you can imagine eventually getting to the point where the dreams are all wonderful in that sense, not terrible, not horrifying. So back to this plane of reality, again, an arhat isn't necessarily hip to this idea of emptiness. What they're about is this emotional stability. So they can walk around this wild world of ours and be emotionally calm and cool about it. The Pratekya Bhutta has realized emptiness, understands everything in that phenomenological way that I talked about last week, where we all kind of are in our own phenomenological point of perspective. So the Pratekya Bhutta understands emptiness, is emotionally stable and calm about it, but again, sort of peacefully observes the chaos of the world, not entirely recognizing that if there's war going on, there's something up in that way. So that's where those two paths end. And then the Bodhisattva path is about purifying a Buddha land and becoming a fully awakened Buddha. That would be Buddhahood. So, Yes, on a very basic level, I've described, I've described, I think, in a microcosm where a bodhisattva lives in an apartment building. 
let's go back to my opening remarks on the peer land. And what I mean is, is imagine that Bodhisattva goes into their apartment building every day with the eyebrows down. Go walking in the front door of the apartment, go walking through the hallways of the apartment complex, and then go walking into my house with my family, right? Now imagine the Bodhisattva that walks into their apartment complex with the eyebrows, <laughs> passes people in the hallways, opens the door, comes home. Hi, everybody. <laughs> the idea is, is that through enough generosity and kindness and compassion and all of that, you could imagine eventually changing the apartment complex, like actually, you know, joy and, and things are infectious that way. And so you can imagine sort of the bodhisattva purifying their apartment complex in that way, in that way of not having everybody be mean and angry at each other, but actually being joyful and kind to each other. It's not that radical of an idea, right? So on a practical level, that purified Buddha land is not just the apartment complex, it's the whole world you find yourself in. And yeah, that's a much bigger project, pardon the pun, that's a much bigger project than the apartment complex in that way. But that's the idea at a practical level of what it would mean for a bodhisattva to purify their Buddha land. However, it does go deeper than that. And it's, it's gotten a little late and it, it's, it's unfortunately because this is really juicy, actually. But in, if you have heard my remarks about phenomenology, or if you were here last week about the idea of self as being this kind of deeply subjective world that we're in, meaning we think we're looking out at the world, but we're kind of looking at our own conditioning in that way, right? What I mean is, is that that way that we relate to the world, it might be a lot more than just smiles and friendliness in that way. Yes, at a practical level, we could change our apartment complex or our world from being an angry one to being a kinder one. But I'm actually talking about an even deeper level of reality that the, the reality we find ourselves in is very reflective of what we think is going on. And as that slowly changes through practice, the very nature of reality could change. And I don't wanna be sounding too mystical here. I, it's, it's actually much more scientific in that way. And, but I don't mean science by like Western science. I just mean it's much more logical in that sense of the degree to which the world could change if you change your mind. How, like how much could it change? Maybe to degrees you can't even think of at the mo current moment because of the way you're currently thinking. So my point is, is that Buddhahood is something pretty special and I'll have to wait until next week to say more about it. So, so sorry to leave you with that ambiguous, juicy note about how your whole world could change, but, but come back next week, I promise I'll say more. <laughs>